Want to support the podcast? You can purchase fun and unique items like t-shirts and books at shanesbraindomain.com. Pop on over and take a look. Thank you for supporting the Discovering Your Mind podcast. Aphantasia is a condition characterized by an inability to visualize mental images in one's mind. If you have just discovered that you or someone you love has aphantasia, or if you're just fascinated by the subject in general and love learning more about it, you are in the right place. The Discovering Your Mind podcast delves into all aspects of the mind's eye, including aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and everything in between. Welcome to the Discovering Your Mind podcast brought to you by shanesbraindomain.com. I am your host, Shane Williams, also known as Shane's Brain. Today we're talking with the one and only Ellis Pinkerton, also known as Pickle, who I have known since the fourth grade. How are you doing there today, Pickle? Fantastic. Thanks for asking. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for a living, what you like to do for fun, that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I've been in uh, uh, logistics, transportation leadership for uh, quite some time um, in the, you know, the category, the space of transportation logistics for 30 years and in leadership for uh, 20 of that, maybe. I'm a uh, father to three girls, um, uh, currently divorced, uh, have a girlfriend dating, um, uh, and uh, recently have been picking up golf. Um, was a long time cyclist and due to health issues, I've, I've switched to something a little bit less intense, um, but loving it, um, especially the mental aspect of it. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the apple graph. If you would like to view the apple graph to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the Aphantasia and Beyond section. If you are unable to view the apple graph for whatever reason, it is a graph divided into six sections. In the number six section, there is a very detailed image of a red apple. In the number five section, it is the same image but with less detail. Number four is still in color but has less detail and more basic shapes instead of detailed hues and gradients. Number three is the less detailed apple but in gray tones without the color. Number two is a simple outline of the apple. And number one is blank, indicating no visualization whatsoever. This is called aphantasia. All right. The first thing I'd like you to do is picture a red apple in your mind. Okay. All right. Now take a look at that apple graph that I sent you. Which one of those best represents what you saw in your mind's eye? It's funny because you primed me for that question. And so I saw exactly that apple. The oh, there one. you go. <laughs> All right. Priming does make a difference. Uh, do you think that if I hadn't primed you, it would have been similar or would have been different? Um, it would have been similar, but but less cartoony, maybe. It would have been a real apple instead okay. of one that that looks like it was produced on a computer. Okay. So you would say it's a number six on, on the Apple graph. Yeah. More like number five. I pictured more of the cartoony middle Apple. All right. Now picture a horse in your mind. Is it like looking at a picture or more of just a thought or something else? This time it was, uh, you know, the first time you asked me that question, it was a real horse um, standing in a pasture. This time it was a painted horse. And uh, now I'm kind of questioning why the difference, um, you know, when we started going down this aphantasia path, um, everything was was kind of uh, realistic uh, in what I pictured. And now they seem to be more uh, car- comic bookish, cartoony. Um, and, and I don't know if that's, you didn't prime me with a horse picture, but right. um, again, that's where my brain went. So that's interesting. Do you find that has ha- been happening in general or just right now? Um, I would say recently within the past month. Okay. And can you, do you have any explanation for it? Do you have any idea why that might be happening? Probably just what's, been going on in in my life, maybe an environmental thing. Um, I've spent, uh, it it feels like half of the month of December being sick. I still kind of sound nasally, but 
when when I'm sick to that degree, I, I feel like I'm in a different dimension. And I think my brain is still adjusting to come back to reality. And also, too, I've I've noticed that uh, lately, because of what I do for work, uh, there are times where I have to use my brain a lot to create, uh, so to speak. The more times you touch something, the more it costs, the more it uh, is prone to error. And so engineering something to remove touches is very common. Um, and and so I think that that engages the creative side of my brain more. And, and I'm thinking maybe that, uh, you know, that's where maybe some of the cartoony painting visualization has come in lately. And, and it's interesting because I would have never gone down that path or even paid attention to that before our discussion about, about aphantasia. All right. Still with the horse in mind, is the image more clear with your eyes open or your eyes closed? Mm, same. Doesn't, doesn't change. I think if I, you know, maybe if I made close my eyes and made a concerted effort to focus and let my brain run, uh, and think about it for more than half a second, um, it would probably get more clear and more realistic and more defined. You know, maybe it, I should have let off with this too, is, uh, and you and I have discussed this, but, um, you know, recently diagnosed with ADHD, and it's something that I've struggled with my whole life, but I never knew what it was. And so for me, most thoughts are are very quick, and then my brain moves on to the next thing. And so asking me to stop and focus on it it, it will definitely fill in. Okay. Do you see the horse in your mind or is it projected out in front of you? I would say in my mind. Okay. Is the image solid or transparent? Solid. Okay. Is it in color or black and white? Color. It's tan. Are the colors vibrant or muted? Uh, more on the muted side. Okay. Uh, Can you describe that a little bit? How, how would you explain muted? Best, best way that I can explain muted. I've been to Italy a couple of times now. Wonderful place. Uh, ro- most romantic place I've ever been. And uh, this, the first time I went was five years ago and I took all kinds of photos and told myself that I was going to come home and print them out and put them all over my, my, my house. And I've never done it. And, uh, my new place, which, you know, you've, you've been to and stayed at, I finally have several of them printed one of those photos. And it was just a a very random thing. And, but I loved the visualization of it. And it was a concrete barrier. One of those barriers that are used to separate lanes of traffic, uh, that you would see on a highway, but it was set out front of a restaurant and I was eating at this restaurant and on the, the construction barrier, it was painted, painted burn romantic in very poor, you know, it wasn't artistic in any way. And when I took the photo and then I, I had it, uh, you know, I ran it through a couple of filters and I came across this, this one filter that really muted the colors, but then also brought out the, the background layer of kind of the overall feel of, of, of Rome, uh, which is to me like a very tannish bronzish type feeling. Uh, and to me, colors have feelings attached to each of them. If you say picture the color red, most people think angry. Right. Um, and I think that relates to some personality quizzes, but the, the, the color tan to me is a very calm, uh, serene, uh, romantic type of word. And so now I have that, that photo hanging in my bedroom. And, and I would say that that is a muted color. There's nothing bright. There's nothing that is glaring. It's just very pleasant and warming and, and also still artistic. I would say that's a, okay. that was a long answer for an easy question. <laughs> I apologize. No, that was a, no, that was a good answer because that totally helped me understand what you meant. Because before I didn't really understand, you know, one of the one of the problems we have is the words themselves. They all mean something different to each one of us. For example, I have aphantasia. I've never been able to visualize or picture things. But I I went twenty something years without knowing that because I just interpreted the words differently. 
pitcher to me didn't mean pitcher. It was a, you know, see it in my mind, all these things, counting sheep. You know, I just all thought they were metaphors and figures of speech. So when you say your muted colors mean to you calm and peaceful, they're not loud or intrusive. They're, they're kind of quiet and peaceful. And that's really cool. That's, yeah. that's, that's a cool distinction because I think a lot of other people would describe their thoughts or their visualization as kind of loud and obnoxious and in their face. But Okay, uh, let's move on still with the horse in your mind. Uh, is it 2D or 3D? It's 3D. Okay. Is the image still or is there movement? Uh, still. Okay. Can you make it move if you want to? Oh, yeah. Want to? Okay. Yeah, if I wanted it to. It's easier to for me to visualize it without moving. So okay. I, I guess that goes to effort. How much effort do I want to put in, in what you're asking me to do? All right. Uh, when you first pictured the horse, was it isolated or was there a background? Initially, it was black. There was no background, but in the time since then, it's been filled in with normal pasture, blue sky. Um, again, okay. all muted, nothing, nothing glaring. Let's move on to the next thing, which is sequence visualization. Now picture a cup on a table that you accidentally knock over. What type of cup was it? Coffee cup. Filled with coffee. Espresso oh. to be exact. Tastes like caramel color? too. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to get there. What color was the cup? White. What type of table was it? Wooden. How did the cup get knocked over? I tipped it with my hand because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. When you knocked the cup over, did anything spill out of it? Coffee. Did the sequence appear as a video in your mind or something else? Not as a video, no. It felt like it was in person, like I was had dreamt it or had done it. or And it could be that I was replaying a past experience. Okay. Although I don't recall one specifically, but maybe I had imagined it or, or dreamt it. I don't know. Okay. Like I could feel the coffee cup as I tapped it. Did the mental image also have sound? Did you hear it in your mind? No, it didn't have sound. Can you add sound if you want to? Absolutely. But, but I, would, I would say that most of the time, if, if you ask me to solve a problem, say, say you, hey, this is broken and we need to get it fixed. I'm not hearing anything auditory. I'm too busy visualizing. And adding audio for me is has to have an intention behind it. If what I'm visualizing, there's no sound, there's not going to be any in the visualization. But if what you're asking me to visualize inherently has sound all the time, then, then it will be there. If it's, if it's naturally occurring and I've had that experience with it before, but I don't, I would say I don't typically add sounds to visualizations. All right. So let's talk some more about mind, mind audio. Do you have an inner monologue? All the time. Is it I, in your voice? Is it in your voice? Well, I don't hear it. I'd say it's, well, that's not true. I do hear it. I would say, yes, it's my voice, but how I think I sound, not how I actually sound, but, okay. which is an interesting perspective because I would say most of the time, you know, there's a, there's a saying I came across recently. Um, we don't see things as they really are. We see things as we, as we are. Right. Uh, and I'd, I'd say that's the same as in visualization or in hearing the inner monologue. I hear and see things the way that I am. So if I'm grumpy, sad, happy, horny, whatever, that's the way that I'm going to visualize hear, uh, or, or, uh, and that's the tone of the monologue, I would say, based on whatever emotion I'm going through at the given at the given time. So, so yes, yes, I hear I have a, a monologue, and it's definitely how I think I sound, not how I actually sound. When you have a song in your head, is it like listening to the radio? 
not exactly listening to the radio. I would say it's more muted. When I really listen to music, I like I like to not just hear it. I like to sometimes feel it, and so it has a tendency to to be loud. But when I replay it in my mind, it's toned down, meaning just uh, softer, quieter. Uh, yes, I, I would. I, you know, and maybe that says more about me. But um, I, I went on a little journey musically. Uh, In my 20s, um, I was listening to a lot of very hard, I would say, music, um, metal and and what have you. And I noticed that my temperament and my mood would would follow that music. And so as much as I liked it, I preferred peace. And so I had to listen to music that promoted a peaceful, calming effect. and, and, and so that's why I say muted is because when you asked me to picture, you know, the horse, I, I pictured it in a muted way, which to me is peaceful and, lo- and accepting and, and romantic and, and not, so to speak. And it was, it's the same way with music. My brain tones it down. All right, let's move on to some of the other senses. Now, I heard you in some of the earlier questions talking about, I can feel it. Right. So I want to delve a little bit more into that kind of thing. So now, if you would picture a chocolate chip cookie in your mind. Done. Can you smell it in your mind? Yes. How real is it on a scale of one to ten? How how real is it to actually smelling something? Mm, Like a three or four. It's it's like I smelled it in a dream. You know, if I could smell it. On a, on a level of 10, I would never need to bake cookies. You know, the, the, right. the, real, the real smell wouldn't mean anything to me because I can do it in my brain. And so the, as good right. as it's going to get in my head is a three. Right. That's why I ask. And that's why I added that, that number scale. Because before I'd ask people, can you smell it in your mind? And they'd say yes. I don't know how to, in my mind, I don't know how to separate the realness to the imagination version of it because I've never experienced the imagination version of it. So all I can think about is real, right? So when, when people say I can smell it, what does that really mean? Right. Have you ever been somewhere and that you had never been and felt like you've been there before? Yes. To me, that's what it's like when you ask me, what is that? Can you smell the cookie? Yeah, I can. um, But I can't really place it. You know, it might have been a cookie from when I was five years old. It might have been one, you know, over Christmas from Costco, right? You understand it without understanding it, if that makes sense. I've been there, but I've never been here. But why do I have this connection? I have this connection to the smell, but it's still not as good as the real thing. All right. Still with the cookie. Can you taste it in your mind? Kind of taste is a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, I can, but not as good as I can smell it. I, I would say taste is tougher than smell. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the nature picture. If you would like to view the nature picture to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the Aphantasia and Beyond section. If you are unable to take a look at the nature picture, it is a picture of a grove of tall trees with the sun shining brightly through the trees. There is a blue camping chair next to a peaceful flowing river with a campfire nearby. Now I want you to take a look at that uh, nature picture that I sent you. Okay. Can you put yourself in that picture? Oh, yeah. Can you see yourself there? I can see myself sitting in that camp chair. Can you feel the sun on your skin? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you hear the river next to you? Yes. Can you smell the campfire? Yes. So if you can, go into some more detail about those things. How, How close to reality is it? And I know that everybody is a little bit different. I want you to just try and describe each one of those things and what it's like and how close to reality it is. You know, it's interesting. You've you've kind of planted this idea of rating things, right? As I look at the photo and as you were walking me through the, can you picture this? Can you feel this? There were certain levels of pleasure or enjoyment that, that, that I noticed 
going through that exercise. So for instance, when you said, can you feel the sun on you? And I, and I could, that brought the most pleasure that, that felt great uh, going through that vis- visualization, you know, getting, getting some vitamin D and feeling the sun on you, you know, um, especially it, I would liken it to the first time you feel the warm sun after going through winter, right? That, that feeling like, man, I don't feel like I've ever felt the sun before. And it's only been a couple of months since you felt it that way, but you know, since the last time. And then number two was listening to the water, um, feeling the sun on my skin, uh, listening to the water. Um, those two things kind of awaken, awaken me in, in kind of like a mental caffeine, you know, the, yeah, the campfire is great. Yeah. Being out in nature is great. You know, maybe I could hear the, the sound of the trees and that adds something to it, but the feeling, the feeling of the sun and the listening to the water, I, I found as I've gotten older that I, I'm a deeply emotional person and I can attach a feeling to most anything. And so yeah, I've kind of really gone noticed, on this. I really noticed that as we're talking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I, I don't think I knew that until recently, but, but uh, like I mentioned, I can attach a, a feeling to a color. I can attach a feeling to a, a sound. And I've, I've noticed I tend to gravitate obviously to the things that I find comforting and pleasurable. And I like the way you are talking about the the real things, because I can relate to those, but I can't relate to having those experiences in my mind. Or I can't get that experience from that picture. I get nothing from that picture, really, other than it's, you know, it's a nice picture. Even when you, in your artwork, even when you create something, you, it, that doesn't generate some type of emotion in you? Okay, when that's different. When I take something from a vague nothingness in my brain and turn it into something awesome, that is super rewarding, right? So when I get done with something and I nailed it and it looks fantastic, yeah, I feel the emotion of that. But again, I'm experiencing that for real. It's not anything visual. It's not in my mind. It's reality. You evoked a couple of questions in there for me. Is So based on what you said, it's you don't dream. You've never had a dream. I've had, I have dreams, but, but you don't picture things. So how does that work? Do you read your dreams? Because that, to me, when I, to me, when I visualize that's, that's, I'm almost in that dream state. Um, And, and to say that it's, it's things are real, but they're not real because I can manipulate it in just using my mind. That tells me that it's not real. Where in the real world, I have to physically move something and do something to manipulate it. And so that, that kind of, and something may feel the way that I didn't anticipate it feeling. Like if I go to touch something and it's cold and I wasn't thinking when I touch it, it's going to be cold and I get a, it startles me, you know, type of thing. Um, in dreams, I don't find myself being startled like that uh, because I, I know when, before I touch it, I kind of have that, that precognitive decision to, oh, it's going to be warm. Honestly, what you just said makes no sense to me. Like, I don't even understand what you mean. I've always had dreams, right? I was just like everybody else. Tell you about my dream when I woke up. You know, I had no idea anybody was experiencing anything different. But when I started talking to people about dreams, I realized I don't dream in the same way. It took me a long time to even decide how my dreams were manifesting. Like if if I was seeing pictures or not in my dreams, or if it was more just the way I think, but more of a, a thought-based um, experience. But either way, there are dreams that feel very real to me while I'm dreaming, even though I can't even put my finger on exactly how they're manifesting. More recently, I've tried really hard to try and identify it like as soon as I wake up, think about, did you, did you see something there? Was there, was there color? Was there an image? I've decided that yes, while while dreaming, it's different than my awake experience. I do get some images and some color. You're a wonderful dancer, she said with a smile as I shimmied and shuffled and boogied with style. Thank you, I stammered. I appreciate that, but I just need to know where the bathroom is at. 
All Mixed Up, A Motley Horde of Funny Poems is available on shanesbraindomain.com and Amazon. What do you do to fall asleep? I mean, for example, this is the one place where visual people really get jealous of me because my mind is quiet and dark always. So falling asleep is really easy. Like I don't have to try block anything out. I just lay down, close my eyes and I'm asleep usually. So I would, I would say you're very lucky uh, in, in that way. So definitely this is starting to be more of a superpower. Explain what it's like for you. I would say the best, the best way I can describe it. Uh, first again, uh, I, I have chronic ADHD um, to the point my my brain never stops. It's and it never settles on any one thing or genre or category. It, it's constantly bouncing around, and it's always been this way. And I thought this was what I thought this was just normal. I thought everybody's brains work that way. Uh, so for me, a thought will last tenths of a second, but in that tenth of a second, there's emotion, there's regret, there's doubt, there's frustration, there's elation. There are so many things that go along with that thought. Um, so I can have a thought about work and in that in that tenth of a second, I've done the math for the calculation that's been you know troubling me. And I felt the elation for figuring it out. And I felt the elation for the conversation I'm going to have tomorrow. And my brain's already moved on to the next five things. But that is amazing. The wake, the wake that that thought has left is still, I, I can still filter through it while my brain has moved on and bounced around to other things. So as you can Im- imagine, trying to quiet that or tone that down or mute it to get to sleep is, is a challenge sometimes. So a couple of things. One of the things that I found is constant physical uh, activity for me is, is a must. Um, and because I have some health issues, that's gotten harder, but I do what I can. I try to, uh, I do, you know, even if it's just walking, um, I, I have to, I have to work the physical body through the day so that I'm, I'm physically tired because if I'm physically tired, I, I typically don't have the energy to supply the brain to, for it to go do its nonsense at night. Right. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, I also, um, I'm careful of the music that I listen to. If I listen to very upbeat, energetic music through the day, it's hard. I have a harder time winding down. Before bedtime, I take magnesium tablets. There's a there's been a significant um, scientific links to magnesium and its effect on mood, digestion, and sleep. Uh, and I have found that to be true. Um, and so I take I take magnesium every night before I go to bed. I also take um, elthanine, uh, which helps induce alpha waves in the brain, which is part of the sleep state. And it also makes for some really vivid dreams for those of us on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I don't know what it would do with you. I, I kind of want to spike one of your drinks to see what uh, elthanine <laughs> would do. If, hey, if we're, all about, we're all about experimentation <laughs> on this podcast. We're just trying to figure all this stuff out. And, so, and then, so, you mentioned, and then, so you mentioned vivid. How vivid and detailed are your dreams? Oh, very. On a scale of one to 10, using your scale reference again, I I would say my dreams are either beyond vivid, meaning that in my head, I've created such a place that I often want to go back into the dream because I liked how it felt. Are you um, able to do that? No. Like if you wake up, are you able to go back and experience a dream if you want to? Oh, it depends. In in the morning, no. Um, once my body decides it's going to wake up, it wakes up and, and I'm done for. Even if I'm tired, I can't go back to sleep. But say if I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I've been dreaming, if I fall back asleep, there are times that my brain will go back to the, to the genre or category of that dream, meaning that, uh, you know, if it was a dream about work, it'll go back to work dreams, but not necessarily that. Or it will replay the same dream. But it doesn't. It's not necessarily a continuation of, of where I left off. Um, but they are very vivid. I can feel. I can think. I can. I can. I can see colors. Can you tell you're dreaming? Oh yeah, yeah. I know I'm dreaming. Really? Yeah. I don't. I don't get stuck in the believing that this is that this is real at all. 
Uh, and, and that's something that I bring into my conscious visualization is it's, it's kind of in that, and it might, maybe it's the same section of the brain. So it just sounds like you have a much uh, closer relationship <laughs> with your dreams than I do. I would um, say it's, it's, it's more of a relationship with my brain. Um, okay. Because I, I have the same struggle with my brain when I'm conscious as I do when I'm asleep. Uh, I would say most of my dreams are more pleasant. Uh, well, that's good. Yeah. I know a lot of people struggle with nightmares. Yeah. I, I don't know that I've really had a nightmare. I've had some events that have taken place. Like one time I dreamt I got stabbed and when the knife was inserted, I just felt something tingly and I woke up because I've never experienced what that's like. So my, my brain couldn't fill in the gap, right? Uh, there wasn't enough imagination there. I would say my relationship with my brain is, is one that's contentious. And I think that carries through into, into sleep, but I have a better time with it when I'm asleep because I can let it run and it's more imaginative. And, um, you know, I have this series of sci-fi dreams, you know, and it's like a Lord of the Rings, you know, there's these characters going on an epic journey that, and there's ghouls and whatever chasing these and it's to me, it's entertaining. It I don't find it scary at all, and I've oftentimes thought I need to write it down and and write a book about it. But I have that thought for about two seconds when I'm awake, and I get bored with it. So I don't, <laughs> I've never done it. <laughs> all right. Uh, how well do you remember your dreams? Not very. Uh, it's it's interesting though. Uh, if I'm having a dream that replays, because I have dreams that often repeat. And, and I think it's sometimes those dreams are triggered by something that happens in real life. Uh, and I, as I'm dreaming, it's like, oh, I've seen this one before. Or, or oh, this one again, right? Really? Um, yeah. In general, when you close your eyes, what do you see? Um, without a prompt, it's just blackness. Can you think of nothing if you want to? Very hard. I, I've been trying to learn to meditate and the process of meditation is thinking of nothing, right? And and I can't do it without, I have to have like a coach in my ear. And so there's a wonderful, those, there's probably several apps, but I have an app on my phone and it's kind of guided meditation mm -hmm. because like this conversation, I need the prompt to think about something specifically. And then slowly they just step down the the thinking into, I wouldn't say nothing, but a very minimal state of thinking but I can't do it without prompts. I'm not that good yet. Yeah. I've, I've tried to do those things, those uh, guided meditations or guided hypnosis states or whatever. I can't do it. It has no effect on me, but if I just want to sit on the balcony and have no thoughts, I can do that. I can just sit there and have zero thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that a lot of people can't understand that. Yeah. So I cannot relate to just being able to think about nothing. That to me is hard to comprehend. My thoughts are already so distant and vague. They're already so close to nothing <laughs> that, that it's not hard for me to go that little bit extra to the actual like, well, that's kind of annoying. I'll just turn the rest off too. <laughs> right. Like, like if there's, if there's something on my mind, you know, something that's bothering me, it's harder for me to do. But if I'm just, nothing's really bothering me, I'm in a peaceful state or whatever. It's, it's really easy for me to just go there and just have nothing. Okay. So now I'm convinced it's definitely a superpower. Because I would, I can't do that. The, the longest I think my brain can go without thinking of something is probably three seconds. And, and I would say that that's one of the, the challenges I, that I, because I am so visual and because I, because of the ADHD, those two things together, three seconds is about all the peace I ever get. And it has to be forced. I have to force myself to not think of anything. And then the brain says, that ain't, that doesn't work for me. How about we, how about we start thinking of this thing over here? It doesn't matter. You know, it's not important, but let's think of that thing. Right. Do you tend to visualize things you've already seen before, or do you tend to create new and unique images in your mind? It depends on the scenario. 
if there's if there's a visualization that I like that makes me feel a way that I want to feel, I'll repicture the same visualization. If there's something about that visualization that I don't like, it'll it'll be the same visualization altered to edit, oh. um, either edit something in or edit something out, and then depending on the amount of time that I can spend on that visualization, like we've discussed. Sometimes it's very basic. And then other times, if I, if I'm focusing on the visualization, if I'm trying to think or create, and I'm, I'm referencing that visualization to put something down on paper, it gets refined constantly. There's the pieces of the puzzle are constantly moving like a Tetris game. If that makes sense. All right, let's move on to reading. When you read a novel, is it like a movie in your mind or something else? Very much like a movie, but better. It's like a movie, but it's where you're the main character, you're the director, you're the producer. And so everything is the way that that you would have it, or everything is the way that you are familiar with it. And I think that, you know, like we've discussed, I think that that can be good and it can be bad because, you know, what if there's an experience or a feeling that, that, maybe we haven't had yet or the experience combined with the feeling isn't something that we've had yet. And so all we're doing is basing the visualization and the feeling off of things that we've seen and felt before. Uh, And that's what I meant by, you know, you're open to new opportunities because you're not basing things off of this visualization where uh, for me, when I read something, I'm getting the best of everything. I get the, I, in my brain, I can pan to a, to, you know, with like, it's a camera and I can see around a character and I can see, I can picture a building. And, and, and obviously a lot of that has to, has to do with the way the author has written, uh, how descriptive they are or not. And, and whatever they don't describe, my brain just fills in the gaps with, you know, imagination, but, but, um, and then with that too, you know, uh, if he didn't say it's raining, I can say it's raining. Or, or if he didn't say it's sunny, I can say it's sunny or vice versa. And oh, so wow. I, I get to set the stage. I get to create the movie. Uh, and I think that's often why peop- some people will say that the book was better than the movie was because they, they have a certain way that they like to visualize those things. And their visualization didn't match the visualization that the director or the producer had of the movie. It's time for You Fantasia, the part of the show that lets you chime in and share your thoughts, insights, and experiences. Today we have Shane Miner chiming in. Today's question is, when you read a novel, is it like a movie in your mind? No. It's words on a page. So I have, I have no preconceived notions of what book characters are supposed to look or sound like or what the plays are supposed to look like so i'm never disappointed by the movies in that regard if you would like to participate and hear yourself featured on the podcast go to shanesbraindomain.com and click on the you fantasia section what about uh what about sounds when you're reading do you hear the sounds and the voices in your mind If prompted, again, typically I'll see the visualization without sound unless, unless I need a sound in it goes back to that. What about narration? Is there any narration that happens in your mind? No, no. If the author is narrating, I hear the author. I don't hear, I don't hear my voice. Is that, is that what you meant? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know what I mean with half of these questions. I just, yeah, if, if the author is narrating, I'm just picturing what the narrator is saying, uh, but I don't, I so, don't overlay so, the narration in the, in the visualization. So the narration isn't audible. Just no, because happening. I'm reading it. Okay. What about, um, what about audio books? Do you like audio books? And if, yes. Uh, do you like audio better than reading the book? Which one do you like better? I I like them both equally. Really, it's more of, uh, for me, it's more convenient for the audio book. So 
what I would do is uh, I would download those to Audible and I would listen to those as I would mountain bike. Uh, and, and what that did for me is it gave my brain something to exercise with as I was exercising uh, so that, so that uh, I was getting kind of a mutual workout. I was working out my brain and I'm working out my body at the same time. Uh, because sometimes I, I found that as I was working out my body without working out my mind, my brain would just go crazy sometimes. And I would get back and I was agitated because I hadn't done anything with my brain. And then other times I found that sometimes just letting my mind wander was kind of therapeutic. So really it was what I found myself doing is I would go based on feel. And if, if I needed some mental stimulation, I would listen to the audio book while I was cycling. Uh, uh, if, if I felt that that was going to be the better, the better experience. And then other times I had nothing going on, no auditory prompts and I would just get out there and, and pedal. Um, each one of so, those had, had a different experience attached to it. Is the experience the same either way? Uh, before you described, you know, the camera moving, all this detail, same experience, whether you're reading or whether you're listening? Not, not exactly the same. They're very similar. Reading, I have more time to visualize. So I would say that the visualizations are better. Okay. Um, listening to an audio book for me, because I'm not reading it, I'm not forcing my eyes to move through lines on a page. My brain will, while it's visualizing what's taking place in the audio book, it's also, there's a 10th of a second thought about, you know, an issue I'm having a work issue, a wow. relationship issue. And so it's, it's not as focused Okay. As if I'm reading when I'm reading it, my brain is more focused on the task at hand and visualizing uh, and comprehending the words, right? Hearing it um, brings a different experience and allows for other outside prompts, so to speak. All right, let's, let's move on to memory. If you want to recall a memory, can you see it in your mind? Yes. Can you relive the memory like you're experiencing it all over again? Yeah, but that's, that's also one of the challenges with memory is, so I've noticed as I've gotten older, memories that I've had about my youth, I've sliced out the parts that were painful and I focused on the parts that were good. Right. And so, and then I've also probably embellished on the good parts of that memory, right? So I would say that, yes, I can picture the memory, but I don't trust it. I don't, I don't believe it's the original experience. And, and I think that that can be confirmed if you go talk to, say, a sibling and, hey, you remember back when we were 10 and we did X, right? And they have a totally different recollection than what you right. have. And you're like, man, I swear that my memory feels real. How, do you, how is it that you have this, you know, directly opposing perspective right. of that same event? And so, yes, I can. But it's with, a, yeah, but is that the way it really happened or is that right. just the way you like to remember it? Is there emotion attached to your memories? Absolutely. Memories that that are good. And I think that's one of the one of the cool things about memories is when we have a good a good experience and and that gets lodged into our long-term memory. For me, along with that memory gets stored the emotion, the things that I was thinking about at the time. You know, like if you ever go back and look at a photo and yeah, I can remember when I took that photo. For me, I can remember what I was feeling and what I was thinking as I snapped that photo or as somebody else snapped that photo of me, right? And then transversely, I think if it's a negative feeling, I've noticed that my brain tends to soften the negativity. Um, I still think about it as a negative experience, but I've let go of maybe some of the pain. It's, it's muted. Uh, do you experience your memories in first person, third person, or both? All of them. It's like the div, you know, going back to the book analogy, you know, if, if an author writes in first person or third person, it, it you get a different experience, right? It, instead of saying, you know, the character says this, it's, I said this, or, or they just, you just see it in quotation marks. Right. And so I had the ability in, in my brain is, is I can be, I can see it from my perspective 
but then just the same as, as a book, I can pan around and I can see it from, you know, a, a distant, a distant, uh, you know, camera or a di- uh, another character's perspective. Only I don't see myself very often. When I see myself, it's like from the chin down. I don't typically see my face. It's interesting. Maybe that's some psychological rabbit hole that I need to go down. So that's uh, that's specifically to memories. You never really see your face. Um, I would say it's that way oh. in dreams too. Tip- typically, okay, it's always neck down in dreams. Huh. That's a new one. <laughs> that's interesting. Probably revealing too yeah. much there. All right. How would you describe how your mind stores information? Randomly. It's interesting because I don't think sometimes I get to choose necessarily what my brain chooses to restore or, or store, right? There's things that I remember that are totally useless. For me, what I found is the most the most common thread to how my brain stores things is what emotion was attached to it at the time. If I felt it was important, typically I can remember those things. If Do you associate your mind with an area or a space? Not really. I would say that there's a, like a screen. Are there, are there rooms or compartments in your mind? Um, not, there can be, but not, not as a default setting. As a default setting, it's probably like a big projector screen. Okay. Sometimes there can be multiple screens that would maybe be different rooms or compartments. But for the most part, it's one screen with a lot of random thoughts that just come and go. If you were to try to give a general description of how your mind works and what you see in your mind's eye, how would you describe it? Random, randomly complicated. Have you ever seen a desk with a whole bunch of like papers and books and pens? And and I would say that my mind is like that. And sifting through all that is kind of the chore of the day. Does how you visualize affect how you perform in your career and or hobbies? Professionally, the the visualization certainly helps because as people are talking, as we talk about problems or challenges that we need to overcome, I can quickly visualize what they're talking about. And very, very quickly, my brain can spin, rotate, draw diagrams, run through scenarios, problem shoot, redevelop. That didn't work you know, trial and error in my brain or say, say I'm, I'm working on, on some data and, and whether it's inputting data into a database or extracting data out and, and taking raw data and making it visual. And in my brain, I can see all these potential possibilities. And so my brain will run through all these scenarios. And so in my work life, I would say that it's, it's helped me. It's a large part of, of probably any amount of success that I've gained because typically the end visualization, while it doesn't normally resemble that 100%, because I've learned to, as I'm going through the process, oh, this will work better, or this will look better, or this will communicate the point better, or this will, the end user will find this uh, easier to deal with. I can run through all of those very, very quickly and start working and work my way toward that end goal, which typically 90% of what I visualized is the end product. Uh, as far as a process, I would say that, and, and that sounds cool. And, and, you know, I used to think it was a superpower and, and I didn't think to a degree it kind of is, but in my personal life, that has not turned out to be the case. So because of the, the visualization and the planning out conversations and, and jumping to Z and assuming those things have, have kind of got me in hot water. And so uh, you know, as I've gotten older, trying to navigate a, a course between those two and using it um, for good uh, or making a conscious effort to use to use it for good uh, has been a journey. And then also in my personal life, reeling it back in and letting things play out and trying to find a path through there that in the past I would have forced because I can see where we need to go and how the conversation needs to end. So let's just force it through. And, and, and instead, uh, you know, like I've mentioned, navigating through that conversation and letting those things play out and not, and not uh, trying to control it like I do in my professional life. That's been a challenge, a journey. And, and it's also kind of been um, 
kind of fun, to be honest with you. You know, that's why I was I was kind of questioning your blank canvas because because you're not trying to work towards something and trying to force some you know round peg in a square hole. I would imagine that uh, not that your mouth hasn't ever gotten you in into problems, but probably less so than mine. Well, no, because <laughs> because I don't think before I talk. Like I, I sometimes will crack myself up because I had no idea I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I can't even imagine that. Right, the same problem, just in a different way. I will often just be in just total not talk mode, and I'll just talk and goof around and say things, and that can get you into a lot of trouble as well, <laughs> because <laughs> when you just say stuff without thinking. It often does not come over well to other people. All right. Did you do well in school or did you struggle? It depends on if I liked the class. So I was a, a straight C student in high school, um, college, college, I'm B plus, you know, anything science related, uh, English classes, uh, anything that any subject that I enjoyed, um, I excelled in. Most of the time, I never did homework. Uh, a lot of my grades were based off of tests. Um, so a lot of times I would go to a class, and even if I didn't like the class, I would never do the homework, but I would ace the test, and that's how I, how I would get the C. Uh, but if I enjoyed the class, I would sometimes do the homework. Did your visualization play a role? Yeah, like in math, I could visualize the, the outcome or the, or the process, the steps I needed to take. To, to find the solution. All right. I'm going to give you a little, a little test. Pretend we're in school. Can you spell the word stormy backwards? <laughs> I'm not good with, with reversing words. So no, it's the same as if I was ever asked to, to say the ABCs backwards. You're a highly visual person. You can, you can look at a horse. You can do all this stuff. Why can you not just pull up the word stormy and read it backwards? Yeah, good question. I don't know. I, I would have to, yeah, I'd have to go through each letter one by one and picture it backwards. I'm just trying to figure people out because, um, because in my, you know, in my limited understanding of what's happening in your mind, to me, that that would be a simple thing to do. You just pull up the word and read it backwards. Yeah, so but, I can do it, but it doesn't stay there. It wants to go back. And maybe okay. that's how I'm wired. It wants to go back to its original structure and I have to force it. Nope. They're like, like kids, they're like kids, right? You get back to where I wanted you. Right. <laughs> so I can, I can see it that way, but a split second later, it's back to its normal order. Uh, okay. All right. What is 28 plus 47? No idea. <laughs> All right. You just, you just told me that in math, you could do it in your mind. Well, I know. Like I could, I could stop and I could visualize how to picture that out, but I, I'm not, I'm not a savant. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't just automatically see the answer in my head. I could stop and add, okay, you know, seven plus eight, <laughs> carry the one. And I would have to stop and think about it and I could do that, but I don't, I can't see the answers immediately. Not in math. But I, I know the steps to take to get there, I, and I visualize the steps. Yeah, and that's why I asked the question. I just want to know what's happening in people's heads. Some some people, it just happens very naturally, and it's just yeah. there. Where others, they got to work at it. It sounds like you got to work at it. I definitely have to work at it. In fact, you know, my brain does what you do. Like I don't know, and I don't want to know. Who cares? Well, why why waste our time on that? <laughs> I, yeah, I think so for me, you know, yeah. with all of my issues, I, I would say the numbers to me aren't sexy, right? To me, it's it's words and how does this thing work and, and you know, kind of anything related to, you know, STEM. I can I can picture that and I can recall those things typically very easily. I can recall numbers that I've researched. So So, for instance, if I'm doing an analysis on a project, I can recall ratios and you know, the important numbers and I can recall those immediately, but I couldn't, I couldn't get to those numbers without running through the calculation. If that makes sense. I think it's because I don't find numbers 
particularly compelling in and of themselves that I don't, I can't, maybe I don't have that ability. Earlier you were describing how if a problem is presented, you're uh, in a split second, your mind will go through all the different scenarios and stuff like that. If a math problem is part of that problem that you've got to solve, does your brain do a better job at, at that point? If it matters more, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. And I think, I think that's just, I don't know that that has anything to do with my ability to visualize or not visualize. I think that has to do more with attention, attention deficit. I think if I, uh, because if I stop and think about those things, I can get you the answer. I just don't want to. Right. And so my, my brain, it's like, I have to know you really need to do this. Stop thinking about all this other bullshit and focus on this number. What is the answer? I, then I can do it but I don't like to. It's just not, it's not fun. Gotcha. All right. One last one. What States border Iowa? Uh, That would be um, Colorado, Kansas, South Dakota. I can't remember. You got one. Colorado. (laughs) No, Colorado does not. Oh, South Dakota. no, that's Nebraska. Damn it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I just want to know your process. What was happening in your mind when you were trying to figure that out? So oddly enough, um, uh, like I can't recall like a specific map. First, my brain goes to, okay, where's it at? And, uh, you know, I like I can see the shape of Iowa, but remembering what's around it, uh, not so much. If you knew that was going to be on a test, could you study the map and then and then pull that up yeah. in your mind once you yeah. study? Yeah. It? If I so if you would have if you would have flashed it up and then asked me, um, even a half an hour later, I could recall it. But, okay. You know, uh, the way we've bounced around the subjects, my brain couldn't couldn't recall the map accurately. Obviously, I was re- I was. And I was probably actually visualizing Nebraska and not Iowa. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Have a good one. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. See you. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, follow, and engage with us. And share it with your friends and family as we continue to explore this fascinating subject. For additional information about this episode or Shane's Brain, check out the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Discovering Your Mind podcast. You are beautifully unique.